Thank you very much for having me and thank you for a great organization. I really enjoy it. So um, I'll begin with a small overview of the talk so you know where we are. So if you don't know anything about modular symbols or what they are or what to care, I hope that uh, in, the next five, in the next five minutes you'll see. And then I will introduce the conjectures of Mason and Rubin of why we care about the distribution of modular symbols. Yes, so don't worry. I will uh, introduce everything. And then we'll see that these conjectures are uh, very much out of reach. But we have some uh, average results towards these conjectures. So I'll talk about the works of uh, Petridis and Rizager, about my work generalizing their work, and see how I develop a different method and how my method can be made to work in different settings, such for the three-dimensional hyperbolic plane. And then we look at the different side of distribution, look about the residual distribution mod P of modular symbols, and then again, how we can generalize all this work to uh, cohomology classes in the n-dimensional hyperbolic space. So OK, after I stated everything, we look at a very brief, just some elements of the proof, which will be Eisenstein series twisted by modular symbols. I'll talk a bit about perturbation theory, and of course, uh, uh, very briefly about how would one prove the distribution mod P. OK, so with this out of the way, let's uh, introduce quickly some notations so we are all on the same page. So I have the usual hyperbolic plane, where x plus i, y, y is positive. And you know the isometries of uh, h are given by SL to R, the linear trans fractional transformations, and the usual volume element. And the hyperbolic Laplace and acting on a uh, hyperbolic sp uh, space, which of course the Laplacian commutes with all the uh, actions of with the, all the isometries. And for my talk, gamma not 10 will be the Hecke congruence group of level n. So matrices of integer coefficients such that uh, n divides c. And by sk of gamma not 10 are the holomorphic cusp forms of weight k and level n. So I'll assume they are cusp forms. OK, and uh, throughout this talk, you'll see it's important that if I take a cast form of weight 2, so from a cast form, I can uh, have this one form, f of z to dz, then will be a gamma invariant caspital one form. So weight 2 cast forms give us uh, uh, one forms. OK? Uh, is there a question in chat? Yeah. I see a. Ah. Can you hear me better now? Is it better? Ah. Should I talk in that one? Yes. I mean, I can. It's a. I could just sit down. <laughs> Can you hear me better now? Is there? Is good? Hello. Can you hear me? Is it better? Yes. OK, good. OK, so so far I just introduced some notation I'm sure that all of you are very familiar with. OK, if I can go here. Yeah. yeah. So now I'll define the modular symbol. So I will start with a cast form of weight 2 for n level n. And the modular symbol is just this. Uh, it's a complex number with just the value of the integral of the cast form between the cast infinity and a rational cast r. So it's just a map. Give, you, uh, I, uh, give me your favorite rational number. I integrate this cast form between infinity and r, and uh, it's a value. 
Okay, and this interval converges because we work with cast forms. Okay, so this is a complex number, and we can define the plus minus modular symbols, which you can think of as uh, the real part of this integral or the imaginary part of this integral, and they are given by this. So R plus and R minus will be real valued, and uh, usually the modular symbol is a complex value. Okay, I work with gamma not 10, but in this picture I just have a tessellation of uh, the standard modular curve, but as you can see, what's happening here, I just do this line integral between the cusp A over B and at infinity, and over this vertical line I compute the, the value. Okay, so this is what a modular symbol is, and why would you care about this? So, okay, and one way to think is like uh, it's a period integral of holomorphic cusp forms. So as I said, uh, these R plus minus are given by real part or the imaginary part of the one form, and they are real. So from now on, alpha will be the real part of this one form. Okay, and okay, some nice translation properties if you add one is preserved or under minus. But an interesting property is that uh, the image of this map is a lattice in R. So it's a discrete image, so it's, yeah, the image is um, lattice, this comes from Neron periods of elliptic curves. And now, if we fix a matrix gamma, I look at this pairing between uh, an element of the group and my one form, and it's just the integral between z and gamma z. And doesn't matter what you put there, because uh, the hyperbolic plane is simply connected. And alpha is gamma invariant. So it doesn't matter what z is, since alpha is gamma invariant, it's just the integral along the path this is a circular path between z and gamma z. Yes, and uh, gamma infinity, if you have gamma is a, b, c, d, then gamma infinity is given by a over c. So in other words, the modular symbol a over c is the pairing between gamma and alpha, where gamma is a, b, c, d. And very important property that we we'll use a lot is that this map is additive by a very simple property. So if you take the inner product gamma 1, gamma 2, and alpha by very simple integral manipulations, you see that this map is additive. So since this is an additive map on the group gamma, you can think of it as elements of the cuspidal part of the cohomology. Cuspidal part because, by definition, this would vanish on the cusps. Okay. No other question? Okay, another way, I just now rephrase a bit what I've said before. So you can think about, uh, we, have, we can describe the homology of uh, our quotient surface by just the group gamma. So for each gamma, I look at the path from Z to gamma Z, and all the paths on the quotient surface are given by this. So they are all homotopically equivalent to this. And actually, it's true that the first homology group is actually the abelianization of gamma. So we see how, so the homotopy is described by the underlying group gamma. And because of the eichler shimula isomorphism, we know that the cohomology is described by the cast forms. So we have, a, this is called the holo, a holomorphic and anti-holomorphic part. So if I give you two cast forms, then all the, Okay, this is, here I'm implying a bit the, the Rama isomorphism, but all the one forms, all the parts in the cohomology are given by this. And very important that if you only want to restrict to harmonic one forms, they will give, be given by the, uh, by the holomorphic part. So if you only want to restrict to harmonic cuspidal one forms, they will only be given by f of z dz. But in general, this is the description of all of them. So this in mind, you can really see that the pairing I described you above is just a pairing between homology and cohomology. Uh, homology is described by gamma not 10, and the cast forms, weight to cast forms give you the cohomology. OK. No question at this point? Okay, there is another interesting application. We'll see that um, these values of modular symbols will be 
central values of some twisted L functions. So weight K cast form will have this uh, holomorphic cast form will have this uh, Fourier expansion. I'm sure you are all familiar with with this uh, normalizing factor here. And now we want to define an additive twist L function. So if I wouldn't have this exponential of nr, this would be the standard definition of the L function associated to the cast form. But I add this additive twist in the definition from the Fourier <coughs> expansion. OK, so this will be a well-defined L function for the real part of greater than 1. And we have all the properties that you expect. So if I fix r to be a over c, and I look at d to be the inverse of a mod c, then we have a completed L function where we can relate the twist by a over c to the twist. Ah, oh, no, sorry. This is the completed L function. But the idea is that the functional equation relates the twist at a over c at the value s with the twist of minus d over c. d is the inverse of a. OK, and why is this interesting is that modular symbols, the integral I've shown you above is just by, so by, this is a bystander theory of uh, how you obtain analytic continuation is just the central value with the twist r. OK, so these are just some, this is me attempting to answer the question, why would you care about modular symbols? Showing some important properties of them. And now I, I want to answer why do you care about the distribution of modular symbols. So what do I mean by the distribution of modular symbols? So I care about how the distribution would fix when I look at the values where I fix the denominator c, and I look at the values where, uh, of this modular symbol map of a over c, where a is co-prime to c. So this will be phi of c rational numbers. Yeah, of fixed denominator, and I want to look. We have this map between rationals, which gives us a complex, in this case, a real value, and we're interested how they behave as c goes to infinity. Or well, first of all, yes. Yeah, so my so the set R C is again modular symbols of fixed denominator c, and as we've seen before, we have the translation by one. That's why I said that I, a can be co-prime with c. And the motivation of studying this comes from elliptic curves. More precisely, if you want to study the excess rank of um, um, elliptic curves over finite extensions, what I mean by this, let's say you have an elliptic curve over Q, and then you want to look at an extension over uh, a billion field. So F over uh, Q is a finite abelian extension. And then the, the BST conjectures implies that if all these central values, this is a Hasse-Weil L function and for twist. So if I take chi to be in the Galois group of the f over q, if I know that these all values are non-vanishing, then we'll know that we have no, um, no excess rank if we define the um, or elliptic curve over f. So okay, in other words, if you know that all these are non-vanishing, we'll have no excess rank when you move to a higher field. And the whole idea is that now these uh, central values of Hasse-Weil uh, L functions come from elliptic curves are nothing else but uh, linear combinations of modular symbols. So here, chi is, chi is the character. And actually, it's a linear combination of uh, modular symbols where I fix the denominator c. So this is the motivation. Maybe if you can understand the distribution of this A over C uh, modular symbol, then maybe you can understand the central value. This is pure speculation, of course. Here, tau of chi is the uh, Gauss sum associated to the character. OK, so motivated by this and by a lot of numerical data, Mazer and Rubin conjecture that these values here if you look at the uh, modular symbols of denominator C, are normally distributed. So if, you re if we renormalize them by a constant times log C, take the, uh, the square root of that, then we expect that these values will obey a stand will be the yeah, best uh, Gaussian distribution as the level as uh, C goes to infinity. So OK. First, I have some uh, numerical data for uh, suggesting this conjecture. 
So as you see here, I take M here. So M uh, is C. So what I defined before as C. So for a level M, and the, uh, the red uh, gra um, the red curve is the Gaussian, and the values under the graph are just the um, renormalized modular symbols. And the first thing that strikes you probably is that okay, M is the size, uh, the size around one million, but I have very few values of modular symbols, and this is because there's many symmetries going into them. For example, I didn't talk anything about the heck action and so on. So this is one reason why this uh, conjecture is very hard. There's very few values of modular symbols, so it's hard to prove something. But nonetheless, we see that uh, this renormalized fit very well under the Gaussian. Sorry, what, what is the fit of the computation here? So, so here we fixed. Uh, I'm sure there is. So I, I should mention all these uh, graphs I'm showing here are actually made by Mazur and Rubin. So they, they actually use some very strong uh, computers to do them. I don't know how to do any of these graphs. I'm just showing them for the sake of showing them. Yeah. So I presume you can go higher, but I'm very sure they use some strong uh, computers anyway. OK, I want to make a very small interlude to say why do we care about normal distribution in number theory and why it appears. So from now, for, for this, uh, for here, an will be just a random sequence. And I'll put some definitions by the expectation up to x. I just make the average of all the elements up to x. And I define the st uh, standard how I define the variance. So the square of the, of the elements minus the average. And also there I define the moment generating function. So I put an extra variable t. t will be a real variable. variable and uh, this will be the moment generator function. Because you see that the derivatives of this in t will give you the moments of the, of the sequence. So as an example, I want to talk about the Erdős-Kast theorem. So if we denote by omega of n the number of prime divisors of n. It's a very beautiful theorem that uh, these values are uh, normally distributed. So the average of them will be of size log log n. And uh, if we re uh, renormalize, we expect them to be normally distributed. I mean, OK, sorry. We know they're normally distributed. It's a very beautiful theorem. There's many other examples, like the Sel Selberg central limit theorem and so on. But I think this one is a nice example. So in a discrete settings, we are the same. Now we'll order this. So the conjecture is that if you order these modular symbols uh, of fixed denominator C, they, they will behave nicely. OK, so this was one of their conjectures. Uh, and the, so OK, as before, we defined the expected um, average and the variance. So we just average the modular symbols of denominator C, and they take the variance over this set as before. It's, it's easy to see that the average will uh, go to 0. So it's not much to talk about it, but it's very interesting, the behavior of the variance. And uh, their conjecture is that the, the variance will behave like a constant times log c as the main term, and then plus a constant. And the constant will depend on what is the greatest common divisors between the level between n and c. So in other words, if you think you're on a logarithmic scale, they will all behave as uh, some lines. We have the same slope, but they will have different shifts depending on how, uh, yeah, depending how C behaves in terms of the level. So I think this is much better to see in a picture. So again, other pictures due to courtesy of them. So in these pictures, I'm on a logarithmic scale, and I just plot the values of, uh, of this variance for some particular elliptic curves, because we have this. Uh, we know that elliptic curves of conductor n give us cast forms of weight to n level n. And the level is 15. So for 15, there are four different possibilities of what is the GCD between C and 15. And we see that the values of the variance will, uh, will be on these lines, on four different lines. 
all of them have the same slope, but the shift depends on what is this value. So this is how we expect them to behave. Any questions? OK. So I gave you two conjectures. And actually, the second one is known in some uh, particular case for the prime level. We know that well, when the level is prime, actually, it is true. And this is by a massive uh, paper by Blomer, Fubri, Kowalski, Michel, Milicevic, and Sawin, which I think is now a book called The Second Moment Theory of L Functions. So they develop a lot of theory, and in fact, this, is, this would be a consequence of their, the of their uh, theory. So again, th this is, uh, follows from the yeah, algebraic geometry methods, very high advanced theory. OK, but uh, yeah, they, it, it, it's only known for uh, prime levels. OK. So as I said, these conjectures are very hard to prove because of the scarcity of modular symbols and so on. And we don't really have the techniques to approach them. So maybe we can prove something more general, an average result. So ra rather than looking at uh, prime denominator C, uh, let's look at uh, where we average over all denominators up to x. So here we have the same numbers as we'd expect the denominators in A and C to be 1. We, s we saw that this condition of what is the GCD between C and N plays a role. So let's say we fix this uh, GCD to be D and uh, take all over C up to some x with this. So this is a much larger set than restricting to 1 C. We take all of them up to x. And of course, we want to see maybe we can prove something on this larger set. So this is a theorem of Petridis and Rizager from 2017. And they actually show that these values in this larger set can be are actually uh, normally distributed for square free level. So with the renormalizing constant as we expect over this larger set, we have normal distribution. And they also prove the conjecture about the variance or about the second moment of them. It behaves like a constant time log x plus this uh, constant depending on the level. OK. And now this is um, the same picture. But now I put all the modular symbols of all the levels up to x. And you can see there's way more of them. So it's much easier to see that they fit under the Gaussian. So this is the average on the larger set, putting the modular symbols, renormalized. And they fit very nice under the bell curve. Yeah, to justify working on averages. And this is also a, a plot for the variance. So again, we are on a logarithmic scale. And uh, we restrict to be on multiples of 11, where the level is 11. Uh, the red dots are the raw data points. So you just plot each variance for each C multiple of 11. We have the line, which is what we expect to hold. And the blue dots here, if you see very close to the line, are the average. So you can see that the average up to that point is very close to the line. And the conjecture would, mean, would imply that these red dots will go closer and closer to the line. We don't know, OK, we know, no, we don't know, the, we know some par particular case of the average, sorry, of the individual one. But you can see it's much harder to prove. Uh, any questions here? OK. So I said, in my PhD work, I uh, developed a different method to prove the result of Petrides and Rizager. And a consequence of it was that I could also apply it to uh, Bianchi modular forms. So quickly, I will um, explain the setting. So um, and I keep, we work on the hyperbolic upper half space. So we have three coordinates. One of them is positive. And the group of isometries on, uh, of H3 is given by SL2C. And um, the underlying field will be, uh, we, we will work, oh, maybe I should put both of them. Um, the same way that SL2Z is a discrete group of SL2R, now if you fix K to be a quadratic imaginary number field, if you look at uh, the matrices with uh, coefficients in the ring of integers, there will be a discrete group of this, and as we've seen in the previous picture, there are very nice pictures of how the fundamental domains of this look like. 
the proof of uh, uh, in the previous talk. And the congruence groups will be given by uh, uh, matrices where the lower left entries belongs to an ideal. And uh, the equivalent things of uh, cast forms of weights too will be vector valued functions. So they will be vectors with three values. And we want to have this uh, condition of under the action of gamma. So P is a element in the hyperbolic free space. And we want to behave like this. I, of, of course, this can be shown explicitly why they are. But here I'm hiding that they are of weight 2, whatever this means. And I want them to be cast form. So if we integrate over the, from the a lattice, they will be 0. And as we've seen before, f of z dz will give you a gamma invariant one form. Here, if we take beta to be a basis of uh, one form for h free, then this inner product will give, us, will give us an invariant one form. We saw before that we have this uh, eichler shimura isomorphisms, that the element of the cuspidal cohomology are given by this. Actually, here, it's a bit simpler. All of them are described in this form. So all of them are uh, one forms given like this. Of course, this is because this is three dimensional. And the modular symbols will be, so we had the real part of uh, period integral, and it will be the same. Now we take an element in our base field, and we integrate over a, a vertical line between the cusp at infinity and the cusp given by r. And maybe to no surprise, I can show that uh, modular symbols given in these settings are also normally distributed on average. So fix your favorite imaginary quadratic number field. Class number one is just, it's no necessary condition. It just gives a much nicer description of the cusps. So you can work with them. And take a square free ideal and the cusp form. So this is a vector cusp form for. Uh, for it and define this every space where you take uh, elements in the base field, the norm of C is up to x, and we have this uh, condition on uh, CNN, of course. And then on this large set, if we renormalize the modular symbols, they will be uh, have standard normal distribution. OK, what I can prove x, so I can compute an explicit rate of convergence. And this rate of convergence is almost as good as you can hope if you think about the central limit theorem, what you get by the rate of distribution in the central limit theorem. You, you, not, you don't have this extra epsilon. And of course, you get the corresponding statement for the second moment. So there exists a constant depending on this GCD of ideals, such that the second moment here is nice. Any questions about this? Yeah, um, if you can compute explicitly or. Uh, So um, it's a very good question. It was a very important um, point of the theory of Petrit and Rizager that they could compute this. Uh, so OK, uh, the, the CF constant is very easily computable. It's uh, what you expect because it's the main term in the normal distribution. And the shifting constant, I, you can express it in some, um, some yeah, special values of L functions. That is, uh, but I, in, I think, in general, how I do it, I can't really write it precisely. In the work of Petrid and Rizagar, you can do it very precisely. And another question, Z is independent of CF? Well, yeah. uh, the, the constant, of course, depends on we fix the cast form. So all this is for a fixed cast form, and we see what happens for these modular symbols which come from the. So of course, yeah, the constant depends on F. And as I said, the CF, it's, uh, of course, uh, we, we can deduce what it is. OK? So, I'm a bit. So, we saw 
Uh, okay, I'll talk a bit later about what I want to say. So now I move to a completely different setting. So we looked at the normal distribution. I want to look at distribution mod P. So I told you before that the image of this modular symbol map is a lattice in R. So it makes sense to normalize it such that the image is the whole of integers. So by when I have the square bracket modular symbols, they will be integers. And uh, the question is, OK, what is the distribution of this modulo P? And the conjecture of, of course, Mezen and Rabin conjectured that if we fix the level C, they will also uh, they will equidistribute modulo P. When I say equidistribute, I mean I, if you fix your favorite class modulo P, then the number of modular symbols that hit that class over all of them, the ratio is 1 over P. As a C goes to infinity. Uh, this is still a co conjecture. I want to talk about uh, work I've done uh, with uh, Espior Nordentoft. We could prove, uh, again, an average result of this conjecture. But a bit stronger, we can actually prove a joint equidistribution result. So now if you fix a, if fix a basis of new forms for a level 2 and, uh, sorry, weight 2 and level n, and now uh, pick a vector in z mod pz to the d, then the number of them that hit the vector over all of them, and actually if we, uh, extra condition that you want to put them in interval, um, the ratio is what you expect. Because the ratio, if okay, if I didn't have this first condition here, it would be 1 over p of the d, because there's, this is the size of this set. But if I also want to restrict that my cusp is it's inside an interval, we can prove this. So it's yeah, a joint equidistribution result for all of them. So each class in z mod pz to the d is attained with equal probability. And we can prove a very particular case of the full conjecture. So we can prove that if uh, we fix the prime p and we have the level n such that p divides n minus 1, we can show that there exists one cast form for which this, um, we have exact equidistribution mod p. When we, when we just look over uh, denominator c, so what I mean they exhibit exactly, it, it means that for each class mod p, each equation is attained exactly. So there's phi of c of them, so phi of c over p. No, no, so I take, uh, it's an average result, so I take all the c up to x. So no. this, if you remember, this set rd of x was all okay. ratios a over c, where, um, yeah, so on. So again, yeah, that's why I said this is average and this one is for fixed C. But yeah, very particular case. And uh, have you also experiments on, on, the, on the conjecture? Uh, you mean numerical data? Yeah. I'm sure there is, but uh, I, I haven't done any. Yeah. So I'm, I, I'm sorry I cannot show you pictures of that. <laughs> ah, uh, I'll, we'll show you this on average. Uh, I don't know how it's. We actually computed it on average. <laughs> this is the, actually the next slide, which is uh, yeah, how well we converge or computing the variance. So what is this? If you fix uh, each class, so we look how many of them are hit in a class a mod p, and you expect that the average is uh, one over p. So if you fix okay. If you count all of them, and you take the second moment of this, so this actually converges how fast you go, then you, go, you, you, you save a small power in x. That's uh, the theorem. And uh, all these uh, things, you can actually compute them exactly. So it's an asymptotic formula where you can compute all these uh, constants precisely. So this gives us the rate to convergence to the distribution, because we show how far we are in each component. Again, sorry. How large P should be? For any P. This holds for any P. Ah, no, sorry, 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 sorry. sorry. This, uh, sorry, this not holds for... Uh... Ah, um, here, P... Oh, yes, I, okay, I, I know where this is. Um, I don't think we can give a precise bound, but... Uh, 
it's such that the um, okay I'll, I'll come in a in a few slides I'll see where it's important that this P is uh, large enough such that we have good approximation for how the eigenvalues behave but I can't tell you but the idea is if you fix fix the level then there exists a P large enough such this is true because then fix the level then there's a P such large enough because then you take X go to infinity here uh, yeah X is the variable that goes to infinity okay and an interesting consequence of this is we have something like we called a cam like similar to Ch Chebyshev biases less did but this is a hundred percent time that the class zero mod P is hit more often than any other class mod P yeah because the same primes you have presumably almost always more primes three more one than one three mod four than one mod four let's say and you can in some sense hope to quantify this if you assume the and stuff here it's much easier we always have that zero mod P is hit more often than any other class but of course asymptotically they have the same size okay uh, if there are no more questions maybe I'll talk a bit about how we can generalize these results to n-dimensional hyperbolic spaces and cohomology classes in there so by the n-dimensional hyperbolic space I have n plus one uh, coordinates and one of them is positive and I have the hyperbolic metric as expected given by this in the volume element uh, we have all of them with this uh, uh, the weight xn squared as normally for two dimensions you have one over y squared so xn is the positive variable for me this is the shape of the Laplacian acting on hn or hn plus one given by this uh, and the group of isometries on hn plus one is given by son plus one one so you might think wait but for h3 it was given by sl2c and this is okay because we have this called exceptional isomorphism between SL2C and SO31. But in general, we can very precisely describe this is isometries by SON plus one one. And what we work off is uh, we take a discrete cofinite groups. In uh, here with cusps, it's very important that with, with cusps. And we denote by okay, this is a bit of abusing notation. I just denote by gamma infinity the parabolic elements in uh, this group. So think about translations. Okay, so this notation. So gamma is a discrete cofinite group with cusps. Gamma infinity is the set of parabolic elements. And as we saw, we have this. We could view, we could view modular symbols as element in the cuspidal cohomology. Or elements mod p, we can think of them as elements of the cuspidal cohomology with coefficient in fp. So in hn plus one, we saw that this we have this additive map for a modular symbol. So we can think about okay, what, how do the uh, what how do characters of gamma behave? So in other words, cohomology classes with uh, coefficients on the torus. And we saw it's that okay, we want to work in cuspidal setting so we, we look at characters that vanish on the on the yeah, on the parabolics or in other words we look at the cuspidal cohomology so in HN here there's many things under the rug but the, uh, this will be again a joint equ uh, equidistribution result so now we look at uh, the FP cohomology the cuspidal cohomology and take T elements of them which are linearly independent. You can precisely define this. And now you look how the variables, so you have this map for each gamma in the group. You look at, you, you have the map omega 1, omega d of gamma. So these would be elements in uh, Z mod P, Z to the power D. And we can show that this will be uniformly distributed as before with respect to. Um, ordering on this double coset remember before we had this group we ordered them by a over c where we took the we ordered them by the size of c that was the average result we had and this one is before you can think of us we ordered them by the height of that 
if we project them to the base Rn. That's how we can think about it. This can be des uh, described precisely, but OK, for to be concise, I don't, uh, I don't write it here. So again, this would be an equivalent of the equidistribution of modular symbols mod p. It's, it's cuspidal cohomology classes with uh, coefficients in fp, which, OK, if you restrict to h2, is the same thing. And uh, OK, we can also talk about just uh, take them with coefficients on the r mod z, and then they will be asymptotically distributed on the, this d-dimensional torus. Um, any questions here? So again, I should ask, I should say like the the shape of there is the shape of these uh, cohomology groups is so wild, very little is known. But surprisingly for us, we don't need uh, to understand much what is happening there because yeah, the we, the analytic theory we use of the Laplace and Eisenstein series will be enough to prove the results of this type. OK, so now uh, for the rest of the talk, I will be in, uh, okay, I will try to finish in 10, 15 minutes. Um, so I will be in the familiar two-dimensional space. So again, fix your favorite cusp of weight one level n. Alpha is the real uh, one form. And we have this uh, modular symbol map, so the pairing between gamma and alpha, which is an additive map. So as I implied uh, before, because we have this additive map, we can think about unitary characters, because these are real. So if we fix the parameter t, we can define a unitary character just given by modular symbols, because this uh, pairing is a real number. And actually, because of uh, Eichler-Shimura isomorphism, all characters will be given of this type. So there's some duality here. So we have this thing. Or if you want to uh, look at the distribution mod p, uh, we look at different type of characters. So we'll fix a class mod p. And I define the character given by this. So remember, this, um, this, is the, this omega plus here is the renormalization that makes uh, the modular symbols integer. So we can think this of a character to fp. So this will be the object we want to study. This uh, continuous twist in T, or this disc, there are two different objects. It's a continuous twist and a discrete twist. This will give us the normal distribution, and this, this one will give us the distribution mod P. And the analytic objects we work with are the Eisenstein series twisted by modular symbols. So chi is a character of this type. If I wouldn't have the character, this would be the standard definition of the spectral Eisenstein series. Um, so we average over the cosets, the imaginary part. And it uh, behaves very nicely. So if we uh, act with gamma, then we spit the character in front of it. We have the chi of gamma. And it is an eigenfunction of the Laplacian. So if you act with the Laplacian on it, it gives you s times 1 minus s. But very important is not in the L2 space, which is crucial. OK. Uh, so a bit of the bread and butter of uh, yeah, daily work of an analytic number theorist in uh, working in automorphic forms. If I look at the L2 space, so by L2 of, I, I just define the space of square integrable function that behave like this. So if I act by gamma, I get this character in front. And look at the, we can uh, spectrally expand this space in terms of the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian. And it consists of a discrete part and a continuous part. And but we know it's a, that we only have uh, finitely many eigenvalues on the interval zero to a quarter. And the very famous uh, Selber conjecture: we expect that for congruence groups, the only eigenvalue is zero on this interval. Okay. If you know that S is a pole of the Eisenstein series, OK. Um, 
then this value s times 1 minus s will be an eigenvalue. And if you look at the residue, then the residue of the Eisenstein series will be in the L2 space. And uh, we'll have this eigenfunction. OK, so I, I don't know how should time, maybe. OK, so next I wanted to talk a bit about how to go to prove the normal distribution. So as I said, this is the method I use, which can be very well used to prove the result of Petridis and Rizager, but can be generalized to H3. And I'm sure it might as well. It, it is generalizable to HN as well. So now we have this uh, Laplacian acting on the twist space. And uh, we can describe the Laplacian acting on the twisted space. It's unitary equivalent to another operator acting on the untwisted space. I define this operator L of epsilon. And the important thing here is that this operator is uh, like quadratic in epsilon. So think of epsilon as a small real number. And I, I say that we want to do perturbation theory because we want to look how the space moves when we act with um, when epsilon goes to 0. And of course, you, we know that when, the, when you have untwisted space, the first eigenfunction is the constant function. And the first eigenfunction is 0 if and only, have, only, if, and only if you have no twist, because otherwise yeah, the constant function won't be an eigenfunction. And uh, it's important that these things uh, behave real analytic, analytically in epsilon. So we can actually talk about Taylor expansions and so on. So the derivatives with respect to epsilon can be computed explicitly. And actually, to come back, this is actually the constant that comes in the, the main constant that comes into the normal distribution. So in particular, we have this behavior of the first eigenvalue and of the first pole of the Eisenstein series. OK. So we know how they behave in epsilon, which is crucial. And uh, the main uh, tool we use is the barriers and equality. So it's a very powerful tool in uh, statistics and probability. So how, how would one normally prove convergence to normal distribution? I think the most famous method is the so-called method of moments. If you can show that all your methods match the Gaussian moments, you can prove uh, your sequence converges to the normal distribution. But now I want to highlight a different approach, which uses the so yeah, the method of moments was used before. But uh, I want to highlight the so-called Berriesen inequality, which you we, we use the moment generating function. So what is this? We want to show that the random variable y uh, converges to the normal distribution. So on the left-hand side is just a measure of how far we are to the normal distribution. And the right-hand side, we have the moment generating function of, of, of our random variable y against the moment generating function of the uh, normal distribution. And it's bounded by this integral. So in some other way, we can, in a very precise way, study the convergence to a normal distribution just by studying the moment generator function. OK, this is exactly what I said. And what we want to prove, we want to prove that these variables are normally distributed. So if you choose y to be this on the average set. And if we do a bit of renormalizing, if we denote you know, t to be this, then this moment generator functions is nothing else but an exponential sum given by this uh, twist of the modular symbols. So we have an exponential sum, just sum of uh, characters of modular symbols. So we want to study these things. And how do you study these things? I'm an analytic number theorist, so I look at the generating series. And I want to understand the analytic properties of this generating series. And how one does that? Actually, this series will be the, yeah, this L series will be related to Eisenstein series and so on. So quickly, OK, I still have five minutes. So it's a very, uh, it's a very beautiful uh, approach to do this, which actually was inspired by the proof of uh, the Erdős-Kast theorem, because you can also prove the Erdős-Kast theorem using the Berrius inequality. And you want to bound this right hand integral depending on three different uh, regions of t. So when t is very small, you want to bound 
this contribution here. And you show that both the exponential and uh, the moment generating function will be very close to 1. So in some, that difference will be small. So actually, this is the easy part. For median t is where you use the perturbation theory, because yeah, the behavior of the Laplace and the poles and so on will show that they are very close. And actually, when uh, t is large, both these quantities will be small, it's both the exponential and the moment generating function. So okay, you have to show there is a lot of cancellation going on. And that's how one prove uh, in general. So this theorem works for any setting. That's how you would hope to prove uh, your random sequence converges to the normal distribution. I mean, of course, you can do precise ranges. Something like power of log t, something like this. Yeah. Okay, so it's dependent on the setup, probably. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, so this would be a, so of course, you, this works for any t, so you also have to be, to choose the best option for t, so you also have to optimize the choice of capital T, I mean. And then, okay, there's a lot of optimization hidden. But yeah, based on capital T, yeah. Okay. So there is a precise way. OK. So this is how one would hope to prove a normal distribution. And OK, this approach works much better than the moment method of moments, where you have to compute each method individually. Because this one will work in much general setting. So you, I can use this method to, uh, to show n normal uh, distribution for uh, uh, yeah, cohomology classes in HN, which sounds, which is a bit hopeless for how Petridis and Rizagar went, using the very, a lot of analysis of the resol resolvent theory and so on. Okay, and now very briefly about uh, residual equidistribution. How would one prove this? It's a bit, so before we had this continuous setting, we have this family of modular symbols given by T, if you remember. And now we have this uh, discrete family where for each class mod p, we define this character. And we use the vile equidistribution criterion to show that things this, uh, converge to um, standard uniform distribution. So what does the criterion say is that if you have cancellation in this sum of uh, characters, then you win automatically. If you want to prove mod p. Because yeah, the size of this set is uh, about x squared. So if you can show something like this, we win. So again, we are related to generating series of this type, L series of this type. Of course, hidden in here are many Clusterman sums and so on. And these are related to the zero Fourier coefficient of uh, the, the twisted Eisenstein series I showed you. And the basic idea is actually very simple. The idea is that you know. When the character is trivial, you know that the first pole is at 1. And the idea is that the first pole is at 1 if and only if your character is trivial. And so on. if the pole is not at 1, then the pole is a bit left to the 1. And when you do all this contour integration, you win. That's the basic hidden idea. OK, I will stop here. Thank you for your attention. OK, so um, to come